let's get going. All right, welcome everybody. Um, <clears throat> at the outset, I just wanted to mention this is our last um, program for uh, for the spring. Our next program is going to be on September eighth. Um, and also, I want to mention that um, next month, May 15th, which is a Saturday, we'll be holding our annual uh, birding outing and picnic at Peninsula Point. So that's always a fun event. Uh, you get to go birding with some expert birders and then gather for a picnic down there. So we invite uh, everybody to join us for that. Uh, Gary Palmer is, uh, is a member of our board of directors. <clears throat> uh, he's, I'm not sure how long, but uh, he's been a board member for quite some time. And uh, <clears throat> he did provide a, a bio that we posted earlier that you can take a look at uh, uh, after the program. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that uh, one of the things that Gary has done in his birding career is identifying migrating raptors. And uh, if you've ever tried to do that, and you look it up high in the sky, seeing a, a raptor flying by, uh, oftentimes all you have is a silhouette. So um, if, if you've ever done that, you know how challenging it is. So Gary is very experienced at that. So, so uh, that's, I think that's an, an indication of, uh, of uh, the, the high level of his birding skills. So he's gonna to talk to us this evening about uh, spring migrants. And uh, Gary, if you wanna say anything else about your background, please feel free. And then otherwise, uh, please uh, take the floor. All right, well, thanks for that introduction, Jeff. And yeah, I'd like to say that, you know, a big part of my background in birding has been as a hawk watcher and I really drew from that pretty heavily in putting together tonight's presentation. So I, I know that a lot of times when people visit a hawk watch, they wonder, you know, how the heck are you guys doing this? You're just seeing these distant little specks and being able to put names to them. So a little bit, the, the first part of this presentation is gonna be um, little bits and pieces of what I've picked up as a professional hawk watcher and some of the tips that I like to give people in how to identify all of our raptor species. And then from there, I'll move on to uh, highlighting a couple of my favorite groups of the migratory songbirds. So let me get my screen share underway here. And I'll keep a video open. I think everybody can see all of that now, right? That looks good. All right. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and jump into it. And to start out, I want to talk about a couple of the resources that I am particularly fond of for learning more about what's going on with the migrating birds around here. So first off, I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about eBird. eBird is a really, really, really great system. It's put on by, you can see up here in the top left, it's a project of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They've got their fingers in all of the biggest projects in ornithology these days. And eBird is the biggest worldwide ornithological citizen science program. It's really an incredible effort that the Cornell Lab has been able to undertake. And from a personal standpoint, it's a really great way to keep track of my own personal bird sightings. Um, I used to keep a lot of different field notebooks, and I still do keep some field notebooks, but it used to be that that was the only format my data existed in. For a while, I moved to spreadsheets, and you know, those were okay. But eBird is a great, great way to store your data and have your observations contribute to citizen science. So I just really, really want to encourage everybody, if you're not already using eBird, it's a pretty simple thing to do. And I would really encourage everybody, anytime you're out birding, keep a list of what you're seeing, go to eBird when you're done, log in, and you can easily, you go to the submit button here, 
and a couple screens later, you enter in a little bit of time or uh, a little bit of data about the time that you were there, how long for, how many people were in your party, and then where you were. And it takes you to this screen next, where you can really, really easily transcribe your bird list into eBird. Uh, it presents everything in taxonomic order which is uh, actually continually in flux based on the newest genetic discoveries. But uh, the main thrust of it stays the same. The waterfowl are in front, and then a little bit later on, we get to the raptors. And at the end of the taxonomy, you've got all of your songbirds. And so these are in a real logical and straightforward order. You can enter in your bird sightings, tell it you've got everything that you were able to identify, or sometimes, you're just seeing one or two birds and don't wanna do a complete list, that's fine too. You can click this no button here and very easily enter in your data into eBird. And again, like I said, this is a great way that you as a hobbyist, as a casual birder, uh, anybody of any skill level is encouraged to contribute data to this huge, huge platform. And Cornell Web of Ornithology has really done some neat things with the data. We're actually hoping sometime in the next year or so to de dedicate a specific program all to the wonders of eBird and learning how to use it. But that's my just a couple of minute spiel about why you should use eBird. And just today, I spent an hour this morning reminiscing about all the birds I've seen in Marquette County. I got a new county bird, and I know this because of eBird, I'm at 268 uh, species in Marquette County now, thanks to that yellow-throated warbler that people have been seeing hanging out at the Dead River Marshes. Um, I finally caught up with that a couple days ago and it was fantastic. Anyway, moving along, like I said, I'm going to focus a little bit for the first half of the program, a little bit more on hawks and some of the secrets of a hawk watcher. A lot of what I've learned is thanks to hawkwatch.org and in particular, one of their main members and founders, Jerry Laguari. He has published some really great references and I thought I had a copy of it around uh, to flash up and show you, but his book, uh, Hawks from Every Angle and his other book, Hawks at a Distance are uh, really the absolute best. Yeah, here they are right here. Hawks at a Distance, Hawks from Every Angle, written by the great hawk watcher, Jerry Laguari. These are the most informative resources I've ever seen for learning more about what a hawk watcher does, how it is that we're able to identify these things from such an incredible distance and from all these different angles. And so again, Hawks from Every Angle, Hawks at a Distance, you can find those through the store at hawkwatch.org. But another thing you can find at hawkwatch.org is a lot of fact sheets. If you go to the Learn tab there, some of the photos and range map that I use in one case all came from hawkwatch.org's website. So under the Learn tab there, there's a whole lot to learn. They have a huge informative page about every single one of North America's raptors, uh, including lots of different photos from lots of different angles. So if you're at all interested in learning more about the art of hawk watching, hawkwatch.org is a great place to begin. And hawkwatch.org, or Hawkwatch International rather, put out a couple of years ago this great app. Raptor ID is the name of it. If you go search in the Google Play Store or the Apple, uh, the Apple Store, you can find this app. And they actually, I paid 20 bucks for it back in the day, but now it's free and it's full of photos and videos of all of these different raptors with Jerry Laguari narrating and explaining how he separates all of these species. So again, these are the top notch resources if you're curious to learn more about hawk watching. And one final resource, if you're curious about hawk watching, is hawkcount.org. It's a place where, you know, every single day this time of year, there's a couple dozen hawk watches going on in North America. And every single day, they all place their data right here on the main page of hawkcount.org. 
So if I were actually at hotcount.org right now, I could scroll down a little bit from what we're seeing and we would see today's live data, lots of it coming in via the Dunkadoo platform that they use, um, that I've used over at Whitefish Point and Hawk Ridge in my previous work. Um, but one thing that I find really neat about hotcount.org is you can find a full data inventory for any of these hot counts throughout North America. And it, rep it can display it in this incredible graphical format. So here we're looking at data from Whitefish Point, and it shows you, let's say we went to Whitefish Point today, April 14th. That would be right about here on our graph, April 14th, if you can see me moving my cursor on my screen, um, we would see that, you know, maybe we'd see turkey vultures, maybe we'd see an osprey, but osprey actually, it turns out, peak at the end of April, early May. And so we can see a general trend using this overview of count data of when we might want to go to different places or what to expect in different regions at different times of year. And so there's a subtle art to learning the ebb and flow of hawk migration. Some species come earlier, some come later. The northern goshawk, take a look at the chart for that one. They've possibly already peaked for the season. Whereas broadwing hawk, a couple birds down from that, they haven't even arrived yet and they'll peak in a few weeks. So let's take a look at the topography of a bird real quickly, just a couple of the terms that I'm gonna be using to get everybody caught up to speed. Um, here's what we're looking at on a bird. Some of the things that I'm going to be talking about, especially when we get into the songbirds at the end of the program, I'm gonna be talking about regions like the crown and the forehead and the nape. Sometimes I'll talk about the back. I might refer to that as the mantle uh, the scapulars or shoulders, the breast and belly are going to be some important parts, the rump, the upper tail coverts, and we can't see them here, but imagine on the opposite side, the undertail coverts, those are some important marks as well, primaries and secondaries, and then the coverts are all some parts that I might refer to throughout tonight's talk to help you pinpoint uh, spots on the bird that will help you identify one species versus another. So let's take a look at our first group of raptors. And I've grouped things again, relatively uh, according to taxonomic order. You'll see that there's one group in raptors that I use that I just call big dark raptors. That's not really a taxonomic grouping so much as it is based on how they appear at a really far distance. But anyway, there's a few main groupings of the raptors we'll find here in Eastern North America. And the first one I wanna talk about are the accipiters. These are actually notorious among hawk watchers even. Sharp-shinned hawk, Cooper's hawk, and Northern goshawk are the three accipiter species that we get here in Eastern or in North America. And they're a little bit difficult to tell apart from one another. And they are, they do have a reputation, especially Sharpie and Cooper's hawk, for being among the more difficult identifications in the hawk watching world. Uh, we're a little bit lucky here in the Upper Peninsula. Cooper's hawk is relatively uncommon. Sharp-shinned hawk and northern goshawk actually outnumber them. Sharp-shinned, maybe a thousand to one. Goshawk, you know, at least a few goshawks for every Cooper's hawk I see uh, on a migration site in the Upper Peninsula. So just playing the numbers is one thing that really can help lead you to the right solution in a hawk watch situation. And again, the, those numbers we saw at hawkcount.org can help get you to the right place pretty quickly. Sharp-shinned hawk is the first exhibitor to talk about. And you'll see that exhibitors in general, they've got a structure pretty different from the rest of the raptors. You'll see they've got a very long tail but relatively short, relatively blunt wings. That long tail is gonna be the primary thing that stands out at a distance to say, okay, I've got an excipitor. And sometimes it's, especially early in the season, when I see an excipitor, I get excited because it's probably gonna be a Northern goshawk. And that is one of my 
absolute favorite raptors. We'll get to them in just a couple, but sharp-shinned hawk is kind of like a shrunken down version of a northern goshawk in a lot of ways. And based on their shape even, sometimes I find sharp-shinned and northern goshawk look a little more similar to my eye on a lone bird in particular when, sh when size is hard to judge. Uh, Sharpie and goshawk maybe get a little more difficult to separate than Sharpie and coop because of how different the cooper's hawk is structurally. And we'll take a further dive into these. Here's a nice photo of an adult sharp shinned hawk coming at us head on. You notice he has just a little hint of a droop to his wings. That's a nice feature to key in on. Um, to me, they kind of take on the shape of a button mushroom sometimes when you see them in profile. One of the things to be really careful about with sharp shinned hawk is that they can somewhat mimic a falcon. This guy right here in a tuck, he looks a little bit like an American kestrel right now. Look at how pointy his wings are and how long his tail is. So that's one thing to be careful of. <clears throat> but a sharp-shinned hawk, he's gonna have this pretty characteristic way of flying. And all of the exhibitors are going to intermittently flap and glide. But the sharp-shinned hawk in particular is gonna really frantically flap, 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 glide. Flap, 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 glide. And do a repeated cycle of that. His wing beats, he's the smallest of the three exhibitors. So the sharp-shinned hawk is going to flap his wings the fastest and seem most frantic and most easily pushed about by the wind out of the three exhibitors. Here's a nice look at an adult inside profile. One of the things that you see here, he looks a little bit big headed in this picture, this adult. Um, and that's something to be cautious of is using that trait alone to try to identify Cooper's hawk versus sharp shinned hawk. We talk about how big the head is relatively on a Cooper's hawk, but sometimes, especially like on this youngster, you can see this bird has a pretty full crop. Sometimes that makes a sharp-shinned hawk looks like, look like it has a bigger head than it really does. So another thing to really pay attention to on a sharp-shinned hawk is the tail. The tail is a little bit shorter relative to the bird than we'll find on a Cooper's hawk, and very often much more squared off at the end than a Cooper's hawk will be. Very often it'll have less of a white tip than the tail of a Cooper's hawk as well. But overall, they are very similar birds. One of the things that I want you to key in on here on this sharp-shinned hawk, look at his undertail coverts. They're unmarked on down here. And that's gonna be helpful at times to differentiate sharp-shinned versus northern goshawk. The next exhibitor we'll talk about is Cooper's hawk. So take a look at this one in silhouette compared to the sharp-shinned hawk that we just looked at. Longer tail, all exhibitors have a long tail, but the Cooper's hawk has the longest compared to their body. And if this tail were fully folded up, it's got this nice rounded appearance to it. We can see up here at the front end that the head proportional to the whole bird is quite a bit bigger than we see on the other two exhibitors around here. So here's a nice look um, at a Cooper's hawk. This is a young bird. And you can see, here's the edge of the wing. And in front of that, the head projects really far, much farther than we'll see on a sharp shinned hawk or a northern goshawk. Here's a great look, a photo by Jerry Laguari that I borrowed from the Hawk Watch International page. This is what they really look like, the Cooper's Hawk, in silhouette. When you're seeing them at a distance, this is how you tell a Cooper's Hawk from a goshawk or a sharp-shinned hawk. They'll hold the front edge of their wing relatively straight compared to their other two species, often get referred to as a flying T. They've got this really elongated appearance, long head, long tail, and actually relatively long wings as well. Here's one more of an adult 
Cooper's Hawk from Jerry Laguari. Take a look at that rounded tail tip. Take a look at the amount of white in the tail tip. And take a look at just behind the top of his head. Look back from that. And you'll notice he's got a contrasting nape. That's one of the things to really look for. If you see a perched raptor, I'll let you in on a little secret. I'm actually much worse at identifying exhibitors when they're perched than when they're flying. The way they beat their wings, how much they're buffeted by the wind, how tight a circle they can fly in. A smaller bird can fly in a tighter circle than a bigger bird can. Uh, things like that are what I key in on. But really, the shape of the Cooper's Hawk is pretty distinct among the three exhibitors to my eye with that big head and long rounded tail. The Northern Goshawk is the largest of our three exhibitors and a highly, highly sought after bird. You can see they've got that long exhibitor tail. They've got, you know, a fairly good sized head, but relative to how big their body is, it's not as large as we see on the Cooper's Hawk. Here's a beautiful photo taken by Sky Haas of an adult at Whitefish Point. The adults are, you know, I don't like to say that anything is unmistakable, but they're very distinct. They've got such beautiful, intricate patterning throughout their body. They've got that bold black face mask with their white supercilium and red eye. They're just gorgeous. Here's another look with a little bit more of a silhouetted look. But you can see this bird has a very bulky, almost torpedo shaped body compared to the other two exhibitors. This one is going to have a much thicker body. And <clears throat> you can see in this photo that the undertail coverts on a young northern goshawk are often going to have some streaking on them. There's a photo coming up in a minute where that shows even better, but you can get a little bit of an idea of it and take a look at his head. It's not teeny, but it's not anywhere near as big as that Cooper's Hawk's head. Here's a beautiful look at a young bird. And one final young bird here, the Northern Goshawk taken by Sky again at Whitefish Point. And they're just, so intricately, so heavily patterned. And take a look at his undertail coverts. This bird has quite a bit of marking in the undertail coverts, and that is going to help distinguish this versus a Cooper's hawk if you get a nice close look like this. And one other thing that really helps out is having other birds around. Goshawks are huge. Look at this bird in comparison to a red-tailed hawk. A sharp-shinned hawk would be much, much smaller. The red tail is obviously pretty harassed by the presence of this goshawk, and I don't think the red tail would care much about a little tiny sharpie bopping at him, but this goshawk approaches the size of a red tail. So here's one quick look at all three exhibitors. I tried to make them relatively the same size. I borrowed pictures from Jerry Laguari for this. And on the left-hand side, we have a sharp shinned hawk. In the middle, we have a Cooper's hawk. And on the right, we have our Northern goshawk. So just a quick comparison of all three together. And hopefully you have a little bit more of a feel for some of the things that can help you distinguish these in the field. Take a look at that contrasting nape on the Cooper's Hawk. Take a look at how long and rounded the Cooper's Hawk tail is and how big the head is compared to the other two exhibitors. And again, if we were to see these in the field, hopefully we would be given extra clues by other birds being presence, present with the goshawk being large, the Sharpie being small, and the Cooper's Hawk being intermediate. So after the exhibitors, relatively a little bit simpler are the Budios. They've got a bit different body shape. So even at a big, 
big distance, three to five miles away sometimes even, I can see a bird and say, okay, this one is a budio, that one is an exhibitor. And then from there, winnow it down further. But the budios are pretty distinct from the exhibitors. They're gonna have quite a bit shorter tail, relatively longer wings, but their wings are pretty broad and paddle shaped. Some of them are gonna have pretty big heads. Some of them are gonna have a little bit smaller heads, but in general, this is kind of the silhouette shape that you'll see at a distance that says this is a budio, that shoulder tail or shorter tail and relatively longer wings. We've got red-tailed hawk, red-shouldered hawk, broad-winged hawk, and rough-legged hawk are all regular occurrence uh, in, uh, in Upper Michigan. Whereas Swainson's hawk, you know, they're more of a Western bird, but I have seen them a number of times in Michigan at hawk watches. I sure hope that I see one again this spring. So I've included them here to give you an idea of one of the special treats that we're looking for when we're out hawk watching uh, pretty much from this time on through the rest of the season. We're actually at a really interesting point in the season where pretty much all of these raptors I'm talking about are in play. Some of them will start to drop off a little bit when it gets later on in the season. And like I've said, Broadwing hawk hasn't arrived just yet, but any day now. So let's move on to looking at the red-tailed hawk. It's got that very generic budio shape. Red-tailed hawk is probably among these budios, the one that a lot of you are most familiar with. They're really the most conspicuous of the budios that we have around here. Um, every now and then one will stick around very late into the year and they're one of the first migrants to arrive back in the spring even among the raptors. <clears throat> so they're one that they sit on the side of the highway a lot of times. People see them a lot. So they're a really, really good one. And they're one of the most common ones seen at hot counts. They're a great one to try to get familiar with. And then from there, red-tailed hawk is like the generic budio at a hawk count. And then I like to say, okay, this is a budio. Why isn't it a red-tailed hawk? and work from there. Red-tailed hawks are really variable. One of the things to look for, if you get a nice close one, is that it has this dark patagial bar. So from the head to the wrist here, this section is called the patagium, and this dark patagial bar, you know, you'll see some marking on the patagium, of some of the other budios, but this high contrast dark patagial bar is diagnostic for red-tailed hawk and can be seen from quite a distance at times. And that will always, always, always be present on a red-tailed hawk unless it's a really aberrant bird. <clears throat> so uh, that's one of the things to look for. Another big thing to look for is this belly band. And the belly band is also present to a degree, we'll see, on rough-legged hawks. But the belly band, the patagium, and yes, occasionally a red tail are things that you'll see that lead you to believe this bird I'm looking at is a red-tailed hawk. And so they're a good one to get familiar with and learn to compare the other budios to what a red tail looks like. Here's a young red-tailed hawk. You can see it's got a little bit less of a trailing edge stripe. It's got a real schmutzy belly going on here, but again, we've still got this dark patagial bar and this belly band. Here's an interesting looking red-tailed hawk. This is an adult bird. It's got quite the dark trailing edge here. It's got the belly band and it's got a nice patagial bar. You can see some hints of red in the tail, but honestly, you really need to get a pretty good angle on that with the bird with its back to you in order to see much red in the tail. So thinking of them as we're gonna see a red tail all the time is actually not a great way to do 
a hawk watch situation because that red tail at a great distance just isn't going to show up in crummy lighting situations. So get used to the shape of this bird. Take a look at all the different shapes he can take, all the different plumages that the bird can take on. Here's another look at a much more lightly marked young red tail. Here's one more look at them in really nice profile. Take a look at those wings. They're a bit longer than we see on an exhibitor, but take a look at the angle from the wrist out to the tip. He's got a pretty broad, pretty blunt wing uh, all the way out to the tip. We call this the hand from the wrist on out. And this uh, red tail, <clears throat> excuse me, is not nearly as tapered in the hand as we'll see on some of the other bootios. So that's something to look for in the shape here. And the bootios, red tail most interestingly of them, I think, around here, the bootios actually come in light and dark morphs. And here's what a dark morph red-tailed hawk looks like. They're relatively rare, uh, whereas the rough-legged hawk, a dark morph, is much, much more common. And a broad-winged hawk, the dark morph, is much, much, much rarer. I have never seen a dark morph broad-winged hawk, but every season of hawk watching, I see a couple of dark morph red tails. And rough-legged hawks, which we'll get to after red-shouldered, are one that I see dark morphs very commonly. But red-shouldered is an interesting bird. They're quite a bit less common in our region, but they're worth knowing about. And they're an interestingly shaped bootio. You might have already noticed, this looks a little bit intermediate between the red-tailed hawk and the shape of an exhibitor. And that's exactly the experience I have in the field with these uh, red-shouldered hawks pretty frequently. I find myself going back and forth. Am I looking at an exhibitor? Am I looking at a bootio? And once I realize I can't decide between exhibitor and bootio, I start thinking about red-shouldered hawk. They've got a little bit shorter wings, a little bit longer tail, and they look, they are a little bit smaller bird than a red-tailed hawk, and accordingly, they're going to flap their wings a bit faster. So one of the things that a hawk watcher really tries to get used to is the rhythm of the wing beats of these various species. And a red-shouldered hawk, again, the red-tailed is kind of the standard to compare everything to. Red-shouldered is going to be a little bit smaller than a red tail, a little bit longer tailed, and with a faster wing beat. And here is a beautiful look at a red-shouldered hawk going overhead at Whitefish Point. But like I said, they are not a terribly common bird in these parts. We're pretty much at the northern end of their breeding range, and not very many of them migrate past UP sites in the spring or fall, for that matter. Here's a look that I think really exemplifies a couple of different characteristics of the red-shouldered hawk. Take a look at the line of the front edge of the wings. Whereas on a Cooper's hawk, we saw a very straight plane along his front edge of his wings, the red-shouldered hawk, it's almost C-shaped. I guess if this were turned to the right, it would look more like a C. But take a look at how the wings are thrust forward in a soar. That's one of the things that really will help distinguish a red-shouldered hawk from either a broad-winged or red-tailed hawk. Another thing is near the wingtips, you can see a little bit of white crescent. It actually shows up much better in this photo. Take a look at that white crescent before the end of the wings. That is a great diagnostic mark for a red-shouldered hawk. And I could see thinking this guy has a belly band like a red tail, but notice no patagial bar. That right there is enough to rule out red tailed hawk. And the longer tail, more intermediate between a bootio 
and an excipiter almost is this bootio. Broad winged hawk is perhaps our most common breeding hawk in these parts. They're very common in the forest, it turns out. Uh, they're not perhaps the most conspicuous at times, but they're there. And we will see them in great numbers. They're really the bread and butter of a hawk watch. They're where the big numbers come from. Um, I have seen over 10,000 broadwing hawks in a day in the fall uh, in Minnesota at Hawk Ridge. And I've had days with two to 3,000 here in Michigan. Had an incredible day with about 2,000 at Whitefish Point one day in um, late April of 2017. So broadwing hawks, when they come, they can come in huge numbers. Any day now, we'll start to see the first couple, but in a couple weeks, there will be a day with hundreds upon hundreds, if not thousands of broadwing hawks at Whitefish Point. And here's what they look like. They're a bit smaller than a red-tailed hawk, quite a bit smaller. In fact, sometimes I can confuse these guys with the sharp-shinned hawk if I get just a quick look at them. They're almost that small. Um, but take a look. If you get a nice look at them, the way they fly is pretty different from a sharp-shinned hawk. Yeah, they'll flap their wings pretty rapidly. They're a relatively small bird, but they don't have that frantic flap, 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 glide, flap, 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 glide that you'll see from a sharp-shinned hawk. They never look quite as frantic. And one interesting thing about them is broadwing hawks, at least in my mind, they tend to be the laziest of the hawks. They've got the longest to go out of all the hawks that we see here and they need to conserve their energy as much as they possibly can. Take a look at just how far these raptors are coming from. Yeah, some of them are as far north as Southern Mexico in the winter, and a couple birds stay in Florida, but the bulk of the population is going to be in places like Colombia and Venezuela and Brazil for the winter months, and then tens of thousands per day, sometimes hundreds of thousands per day, funnel past some of these hawk watch sites uh, in Central and Central America and the Southern United States. But they have a long, long way to go on their journey. So they're going to try to use everything they have to their advantage. They're going to be a species that really hates trying to cross water. They really, really bunch up at coastlines. That's what makes Whitefish Point and Hawk Ridge and all of these different points and ridges on shorelines really great spots for seeing humongous numbers of broad-winged hawks at a time. And sometimes we will, I have seen scenes just like this. Broad-winged hawks are my favorite and the one I hate most simultaneously. They suck to count. They are doing everything all over the place, swirling in these humongous tornadoes that we call kettles. Sometimes they'll get fairly orderly, and sometimes you'll see a big tornado swirling, and then all of the birds will start to stream from one kettle to the next, riding these rising currents of warm air called thermals but these birds are trying to do everything they can to conserve energy, ride that rising air, and then coast to the next pocket of rising air until they can ride that one, and then repeat all the way from Columbia to Canada over the course of a couple months in the spring. So they're just fascinating to watch, and they collect in huge, huge numbers. Here's a nice look at a bird from Whitefish Point. And here's a really good example from Jerry Laguari of what they look like in profile. So remember, I pointed out the hand on a previous bird. This one is gonna, at times, have a little bit more pointed hand. It's gonna have that short bootio tail, relatively small head. 
And this nice dark trailing edge is going to tell us that this is an adult bird among a couple other features we see here. But this is what they look like in profile, a little bit pointier than you're going to see on a red-tailed hawk. And lots of times we will see them together with other birds, which is where relative size is going to really come in handy. They're quite a bit smaller than a red-tailed hawk. Now the rough-legged hawk is another good one to try to use that baseline of red-tailed hawk as a comparison to arrive at rough-legged hawk. I look at a bird and say, oh, red-tail, oh no, wait a minute, there's something off about this bird. And then eventually, sometimes, it turns out to be a rough-legged hawk. One of the things that's pretty different about a rough-legged hawk as compared to a red-tailed hawk is this bird has a little bit longer wings. It's not obvious, but when you watch the bird fly, the wing beat is a little bit looser, a little bit more relaxed. The bird is a little bit more buoyant. They've got a little bit more area under their wing compared to the mass of their body, uh, as you'd see on a red-tailed hawk. And that makes these birds just float a little bit differently from a red-tailed hawk. They flap a little bit looser and they look quite a bit different. Once you can get the bird close enough that you're starting to see any sort of plumage detail, there's a lot to go on. Sure, they've got quite the belly band. Sometimes it looks similar to the belly band you're gonna see on a red-tailed hawk even. It turns out that the rough-legged hawk is one of the more variable birds we will see. Uh, along with the red-tailed hawk, it goes from a real light plumage to a real dark plumage. This is actually kind of a lighter end, uh, light morph, rough-legged hawk. And a couple of the things to notice here, the wrist patches. That will be one of the diagnostic marks to show you you're looking at a rough-legged hawk. Like I said, they come in a huge range of color morphs. They're one of the most beautiful raptors we get, in my opinion. It's just watching the variability as dozens or hopefully some days hundreds drift by is one of my favorite aspects of hawk watching. Now, these birds will pretty often, especially if we're seeing them wintering on territory, you might see them hover hunting. So that's a good thing to watch for. And take a look. We can see one nice thing here that tells us for sure this isn't a red-tailed hawk. And that is, once again, we can see the patagium here, no bar. So that is one of the best features to look for on a Budio. If we were just going by belly band, we'd be confused here with this bird. Here's a nice look at a relatively unmarked rough-legged hawk, but look at the wrist patches once again. Take a look, the tail is a little bit longer than we might see in a red-tailed hawk. The wings are a little bit longer and a little bit more sharply pointed. One of the things, and unfortunately I couldn't find a great photo to illustrate this, but one of the things about a rough-legged hawk is that they'll fly with a little bit of a modified dihedral, and that's a term I'll use a little bit again later on when we're talking about a couple of the other raptors, but the modified dihedral, what I mean is that they hold their wings up, but they hold them up to the wrist and then it's flat. Whereas on a turkey vulture, he's just got this deep dihedral V, a rough-legged hawk holds their wings in a modified dihedral when they're in a soar. So that is another great characteristic to look for on them. Briefly, Swainson's hawk is a special treat here. Take a look at how long and pointed those wings are. Take a look at how long that tail is. Here is a gorgeous young Swainson's hawk from Whitefish Point. 
notice that the flight feathers are darker. They're contrasting with the rest of the underwing. Take a look at how sharply pointed the wings are for a Budio. Take a look at how long that tail is. Here's a beautiful one from out west taken by Jerry Liguari. And finally, an adult Swainson's hawk in flight taken by Sky Haas. The Northern Harrier superficially actually can look like a lot of different birds. It looks a little bit, you know, even if I flip between Swainson's hawk and Northern Harrier, there are some superficial similarities. Both are really long birds, uh, but the Northern Harrier, take a look at how flat that face is. That's one of the things that's really gonna help us arrive at Northern Harrier, is they have this flat owl-like facial disc. Take a look at the rump on this bird. That white rump patch will stand out pretty well on a Northern Harrier. It of course is not a good idea to use that as the only character you're using to identify a bird, but it'll really help. And um, it is one of the main characters to use for a Northern Harrier. Here's a nice look at a female Northern Harrier. Lots of times we think of Northern Harriers uh, as coasting low over a marsh. They're also known as marsh hawk, but Sometimes we'll see them high overhead in a migration setting. Here's a nice look at a young bird. And sometimes people refer to the Northern Harrier as the great fooler. It can really, really take on a stunning variety of different shapes in flight. And sometimes it will look like an occipiter. Sometimes it will look like a budio. Sometimes it will look like an eagle. So they're one to really be careful with, but a lot of times the combination of that long tail, that white rump patch, that flat face, and an erratic flight very often, they very seldom in my experience fly in a direct line. Lots of times they're circling and changing their mind about which direction to go. There are a lot of different characters to go on with a, a Northern Harrier. Here's a nice look at an adult male. One of the things I like to look for on a young bird like this, take a look at the axillary region or the armpit region where the wings and body come together. That dark axillary is actually pretty helpful to look for on a young bird like this when they're flying overhead. And here's that grouping big dark raptors I referred to earlier. We've got Turkey vulture, osprey, bald eagle, and golden eagle. Turkey vulture is going to be, I know it's everybody's favorite. Um, it's actually one of my favorites, it really is. They're very fun to watch. Like I said, some of these keep their wings in a real deep dihedral. That's gonna be very characteristic of the turkey vulture, as is the high contrast between the underwing and the flight feathers. They're really wobbly in flight, easy to mistake for an eagle at a great distance, surprisingly, but an eagle is much steadier in flight as opposed to a turkey vulture. Osprey, it's another one of these big dark raptors that can easily be confused for an eagle. But take a look, it's a little bit more angular. It's got a pretty long tail. It's got a pretty pointed hand. It's got a pretty similar behavior, a lifestyle to an eagle. They like fishing, eagles like fishing. But take a look at just how long and pointed those wings are. That will help distinguish an osprey from an eagle as will their tendency of flying head on. A lot of times they'll fly in with heavily bowed wings, whereas an eagle will fly with a much flatter plane. The bald eagle, this one really is everybody's favorite, I know. And this one is a good 
example, just like with our Budios, the red tail was the generic to compare everybody to, the bald eagle can kind of be our generic big dark bird to compare all others to and say, okay, is this a bald eagle? No, why isn't it? But bald eagles, they've got these big plank-like wings, kind of almost a two by four board of wings, big head, relatively short tail. And when you get a good look at an adult, they're unmistakable. They've got that bald head, the white tail. One of the interesting things that I really enjoy about bald eagles is it takes them four to five years to reach adult plumage. You can actually tell uh, in most birds how old they are, whether they're one, two, three, four, or older in terms of their age since hatching. This is a pretty young bird. Take a look at how white the axillary region is. That's one of the best ways to distinguish a young bald eagle from a golden eagle. Look where the white is. There's white in the axillaries on a bald. Never will there be white in the axillaries on a golden. Here's another young bald eagle. This one's probably about three years old and it's got quite a bit of white speckling in the underwings still. It's got this interesting white eye stripe going on. Here's a bird that's about four years old, still some white speckling. Golden eagles are always going to look a little bit different. And here are the key things to tell a golden eagle apart from a bald eagle. They've got a smaller head. They've got a longer tail and the wings, while broad and plank-like, are pinched in ever so slightly toward the body. So when you get a good look at one in profile, like in this shot, the way those wings pinch in toward the body and that smaller head relative to body size and that longer tail are the things that tell me this is a golden eagle and not a bald eagle. One other thing that's a really neat trick I've picked up over the years is that a golden eagle, when they're flying, they're always going to end on an upstroke and then cock their wings in a mild dihedral. Whereas a bald eagle, they end their flaps on a downstroke and then keep their wings pretty even. It's a little subtle trick, but when you're trying to identify an eagle that's three miles away, that's one of the best ways to do it. Take a look at this bird. Where is the white? There's some white at the base of the flight feathers, but none anywhere on the underwing coverts, none on the body. That's a big hint that this is a golden and not an immature bald. Here's a nice look at an adult golden. Sometimes they can show varying amounts of white in the flight feathers and body. A lot of times with a golden eagle, you will actually get to see that golden flash of the nape. It shows really nicely on this one here. Here's a young bird with these white patches at the base of the wings. And one thing that might help you identify a golden eagle Ravens do not like them. If you're watching a big dark bird get harassed by a raven, start thinking golden eagle. The falcons are really pointy and really fast. Those are the main things I see when I see a falcon that instantly tell my brain falcon is a pointy fast bird. We've got American kestrel, merlin, peregrine falcon, and I threw in the special treat, even though I never have seen one in a migration setting, I threw in a jeer falcon because we had several in the UP last winter. So here's a generic silhouette of a falcon. Look how pointed it is. Relatively long tail, but those wings are so pointed. And this is going to be a really fast group of birds. They go, the peregrine falcon in particular, is known to be the fastest animal on earth. The American kestrel is the smallest of our falcons. It's got relatively slender wings and long tail. 
And one of the descriptions I really like that Josh Haas, he uh, made one of my favorite uh, Hawk resources. He's got a DVD called Hawks on the Wing. He likes to talk about Kestrel as having flappy banana peel wings. And now that's all I see anytime I see a Kestrel in flight is these flappy banana peels attached to a little stick. Here's a look at a male Kestrel. It's one of our rare raptors that's actually pretty heavily dimorphic. It's got an orange back and blue wings, and then this white line of spots along the flight feathers. Here's a nice look from Jerry Laguari at a female with that solid brownish orange back. Merlin is a little bit bigger than a kestrel, a little bit bulkier, and a little bit feistier. They like to stop and hold territory. This is one from Whitefish Point that set up territory pretty early in the season. And they're often a real heavily, real heavily marked, real streaky bird that again, just shoots by almost faster than you can see. Another tip on Merlin that I learned from Josh Haas's video is that they are much more likely than the other falcons to attack other birds even on migration, they will go out of their way to go after any surrounding birds. That's not a rule that they always will, but if you see a falcon and it's going after other raptors, start thinking about Merlin. Here's another beautiful look from Jerry Laguari. Peregrine falcon is the third and final of the common migrants in uh, among the falcons in the UP, they're pretty well known among most of us. They're a bit bulkier bird, big deep body, and those long pointed wings. And again, they are fast. So watch closely as they go by or you will miss them. Jeer falcon, huge bird. This is the bird from Marquette this year. And again, I've never gotten lucky enough to see these on migration, so I don't really have great tips on how to separate them at a distance. But if you get the opportunity to see a jeer falcon, go for it. They are incredible birds. So, again, I know. Mary, you know yep. I'll let, let you catch your breath for just a minute before you go into a different group. Okay. I had one question uh, somebody asked, what was the uh, app you mentioned for Raptors? What's it called? It's called Raptor ID. Okay, great. Familiar with that. Yeah, Gary, this is Jeff. I wonder if I could jump in with a quick question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the turkey vulture, of course, soars, you know, probably more than most of the other Raptors, but <clears throat> um, can you talk a little bit about that uh, why they hold that that exaggerated uh, dihedral is that is there something about the physics of that dihedral that helps them soar for long long periods? You know, well the the broad winged hawk are a big time soarer too, and they don't really they hold their wings on a much flatter plane. So I've I've not heard anything about any aerodynamic advantage that you get from a dihedral versus a flat plane that I can think of, but that's a really interesting question. Okay, yeah, I was just curious, and, and like you said, I do, you know, you do see them tilting a lot. Yeah, um, they're very wobbly in flight. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, and I know sparrows are one of my favorite groups, not everybody's. Some people refer to them as little brown jobs and ignore all of them they see. I wanted to highlight them as well to try to, try to demystify sparrow identification as well and try to point out some of the things that my eye is drawn to when I instantly take a look at a sparrow and can place it into one of these species on the screen right now. These are you know, not every single sparrow you could see here, but these are the common ones. So we'll just run through these relatively quickly, highlighting some of the big differences between one species and the next, 
and hopefully they won't just be little brown jobs that everybody ignores after this. The chipping sparrow, he's got this rufous cap, but take a look at the contrasting white supercilium. That's going to be the best way to help distinguish chipping sparrow from the biggest confusion uh, species, American tree sparrow. And if we could see the breast on this bird, we'd notice that it's blank. No spots, no streaking, nothing really going on in terms of malar striping or chin striping on this bird. But again, that dark eye stripe, white supercilium, rufous cap, that contrast there is one key thing to look at to separate chipping sparrow from tree sparrow, which is the biggest confusion species. Uh, clay colored sparrow, I think is the second biggest confusion species for chipping sparrow. One of the things that I notice when I look at this photo in particular, the most contrast I see is in that mustache or malar stripe. He's got a pretty white malar stripe contrasting with some darker stripes. And then look at the auricular, that space behind the eye where the ear would be, or is rather. The uh, auricular is kind of clay colored on this bird. I know it sounds like a little bit of a weird name, clay colored sparrow, but I think they're among the well-named birds that we have around here. Here is another closely related bird. This is one of the less common sparrows in my presentation tonight. This is a field sparrow. This one we might see occasionally in Marquette, especially down in the Sawyer Plains. I see more and more of them the farther south I go though. And take a look. It's a pretty plain bird. There's not a whole lot to key in on, is there? And that's one of the keys of the field sparrow is that blank faced look. He looks almost surprised, wide eyed because of that white eye ring and very little marking in the auriculars, no eye stripe. There's just not much going on. It looks blank and it's got that same rufous cap and the bill is a little bit on the pink side on the field sparrow. So white eye stripe, blank, face, pink bill, says field sparrow. Here, the American tree sparrow is the one I see most commonly confused for chipping sparrows. One key, remember I talked briefly about timing. The American tree sparrow is here earlier in the season than the chipping sparrow is. There's a good key to help you figure out which one you have. Right now, there aren't chipping sparrows up here yet but there are tree sparrows. So timing alone is very helpful, but there's a period of overlap. So it is really important to know the differences from one species to the next on these confusion species. But take a look, I already gave you all the keys you need. The eye stripe doesn't contrast quite so much with the supercilium and cap here. There's a gray supercilium on the tree sparrow, as opposed to that bolder, whiter supercilium of the chipping sparrow. Take a look at the bill of this bird. It's bi-colored. We've got orange on the bottom and dark colored on the top, or culmin. Take a look at the breast. There's this central breast spot. That is never going to show up on a chipping sparrow unless he got himself dirty somehow, that's just not a plumage feature you're going to see on a chipping sparrow. So those are a few of the things that you can use to separate those species. Dark-eyed junco doesn't really have any confusion species. They're gorgeous, they're incredibly variable, and they're here often year round. We'll see them in the winter, we'll get lots of them on migration, and they're actually not an uncommon breeder in the right habitats around here. But they've got these dark eyes, our jun uh, juncos around here are the slate colored race and they live up to their name pretty well. Here's a fun one. I really like white crowned sparrows. In fact, the whole genus they're in, the Zona trichia, which includes white crowned, white throated and Harris's that we see in our region, uh, 
I think they're fun birds. They're a little bit bigger than the rest of the sparrows. Lots of times you'll find these guys on the ground. White crowned sparrow, again, lives up to its name pretty well, unless you see a young bird. A white crowned sparrow in its juvenile plumage doesn't actually have a white crown. So here's one we need to be a little careful about. It's got these browner crown stripes as opposed to the bold black and white of an adult. But imagine this in black and white and you've got the exact same bird. The structure is really good to key in on on a white crowned sparrow. They're a big bulky bird with a little bit of a peaked head. Now, another close relative of theirs is the white-throated sparrow. This is a very common breeder around here. Uh, none have shown up that I'm aware of migrating yet. They're not too far behind. Um, there have been a couple that hung around the area all winter long. So they're a pretty hardy bird. They love the North Woods. We'll hear them singing, oh, sweet Canada, 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 all summer long. One of the things to look at on the white-throated sparrow, take a look, it does have a white throat, but even more helpful in my eye is this spot between the eye and the bill, the yellow lores. Because white-throated sparrow comes in two distinct morphs. We see our white morph in my first photo and the tan morph in this second photo. So, they're not male and female, they're just different morphs. Much like we saw light morph and dark morph on some of the hawks, we have white morph and tan morph of the white-throated sparrow. And again, the throat, I'm not sure that that's as white as we see on the white morph, but it's still kind of white. The biggest thing that I see that tells me this is the same bird, you know, they've got the same structure, but again, that yellow lore spot right here between the eye and the bill. That tells you it's a white-throated sparrow, although watch out because we'll see Savannah sparrow also has a yellow lore. Harris's sparrow is another zonotrichia. They're relatively uncommon around here, but they're a really special, really beautiful treat. So I wanted to throw them in as well. They're a little bit larger even than the white crowned sparrow. So you might see flocks of white crowns foraging on the ground and then something even bigger hops out and it's a Harris sparrow. This guy's got this nice pink bill, a little bit of a black bib. This is a young bird. I see many more young birds than adults when it comes to Harris sparrows in the UP. But here's what the adult looks like. They've got this more he, uh, more heavily marked face, this black face mask altogether, but this pinky orange bill, this big structure, relatively peaked head, and they love foraging on the ground. Here's a bird that I often forget about it, honestly, until I see the first one of the season and say, oh yeah, those exist. This is a Vesper Sparrow. They're one that the habitat is gonna be a pretty helpful key. They're a sparrow that likes a more open, brushy area. I saw my first one just last week when I went down to Peninsula Point in a brushy field at the north end of the area there. Take a look though at that bold white eye ring that this bird has. It's not quite as bold as some of the other species, but it gets us to where we need to be. And when you see this bird flush, you'll see that the white outer tail feathers often stand out. Here's a great one that is much less common than all of the, uh, than most of the other sparrows I've shown here, but this is a Leconte sparrow. It's in a totally different genus. It's Amospiza, uh, whereas the rest of them, uh, you know, the Zonotrichia I just showed you, the Vespertinus, no, the, uh, Passerculus sandwichensis is the savanna sparrow coming up, but here is a Leconte sparrow in the genus Amospiza. He's got this very flat head, this neat little blue bill. Take a look at this purplish spotted nape. Really a very funky sparrow, very different from the rest of them. Has a much weaker 
flappier flight as well, tends to be found in tall grasses. There is the savanna sparrow. Remember I said the yellow lore was very helpful in identifying a white-throated sparrow, but it's also present on a savanna sparrow. A savanna sparrow has got a little bit more delicate, a little bit more sharply pointed bill than does a white-throated sparrow, and it's much differently streaked. Big differences to go on there, so don't just key in on the yellow lore, but make sure to use that as one of your clues. Here's a song sparrow, one of our most common sparrows. Pretty heavily patterned face, streaks on the sides, streaks throughout the breast, little white throat. And take a look, one of the keys, this breast spot is going to help identify song sparrow. The bigger confusion species for song sparrows, uh, perhaps Lincoln's sparrow. So take a look at the pattern of streaking on this bird as compared to our next bird, the Lincoln sparrow. It's a much finer paintbrush that the artist used to paint the plumage on this Lincoln sparrow. Look how fine those streaks are. And look at the buffy base color behind the streaks and on his mustache. Those are big differences between Lincoln's and Song Sparrow. Now here's a really plain one, but there's a lot to go on still. It's obviously a sparrow, and we'll often see them in the habitat they're named for. This is a swamp sparrow. There's a little hint of a breast spot. That's not gonna help a whole lot. The face is not very patterned, but not blank either. They're a little bit intermediate in terms of the sparrows, but they're a pretty approachable one as well. The Eastern tohi is very distinct and relatively rare here, but a gorgeous bird nonetheless. So we'll fly through our warblers. Lots of warblers here, but they are the true highlight of the month of May in the Upper Peninsula. So we'll take a look. Here's the oven bird, a very skulky warbler. You'll often find them down low, foraging on the ground even. And they have one thing we can't see here. And in fact, an oven bird, you're going to hear them way, way more often than you see them. They're kind of secretive. But one of the things we can't see here that would help identify the oven bird is they've got an orange crown stripe. Other than that, you know, they actually look superficially similar to a thrush, I think. Speaking of thrushes, here's the northern water thrush, which is actually, again, not a thrush, but a warbler. Very streaky, yellow and brownish bird. Take a look at this yellow creamy eye stripe that it has. The biggest confusion species would actually be the rarity Louisiana water thrush. And the eye stripe would be the biggest difference between northern water thrush and Louisiana water thrush. So if you think you might have a Louisiana, get a good photo of that eye stripe and the streaking on the breast. But here's our common northern water thrush. Here is a gorgeous bird that nests in big numbers in Kate's grade in southern Marquette County is one great example I know of. This is the golden winged warbler and you can see it lives up to its name again. It's got that nice golden patch on the wing. It's got a nice golden head <clears throat> and a black face mask and black throat. It's a pretty distinct bird. Black and white warbler, again, lives up to its name perfectly. Black and white stripes. Here's what the female looks like. And here's what the male looks like. Often, even if I can't see the plumage, this is one of those things that I can tell what kind of bird I'm looking at because they behave a bit differently. They behave a little bit more like a nuthatch sometimes. They'll creep along a tree branch or even a trunk at times, more like a nuthatch or a creeper uh, than some warblers do. 
So they're a really neat one in that they've got such a unique behavior. Sometimes I don't need to see the plumage or even the shape very well to know. I just get a little snippet of the bird through the leaves and I can say, I bet this is a black and white. Here's a nice Tennessee warbler. They've got a bold eye stripe contrasting well with their cap and an orangey yellow uh, mantle that contrasts well with the cap and nape. Here are a couple nice photos of orange crown warbler. They're one that they're pretty plain and they're pretty late in the season. Oftentimes, I have to struggle with orange crown warblers and rule everything else out before I've finally settled on orange crown. Nashville warbler is going to be among our more common warblers. And take a look at that face. So one of the big confusion species that sometimes people get excited and try to turn a Nashville warbler into will be a Connecticut warbler. But look at the face, look at the throat. The Nashville warbler has a gray hood and a white eye ring and even a pinky bill, but that throat is yellow. There's a number of things wrong with it too for Connecticut warbler, but the throat is one of the biggest things to look at and the leg color. And then there's the behavior of the bird as well. A Connecticut warbler seen here, they often stay low. They'll look superficially similar to a Nashville warbler. They've got that same gray hood. They've got that same bold eye ring and they've got a pink bill, but look at that dark, dark slaty throat. The hood is complete and encompasses the throat and breast as well. And look at those bright legs. That's gonna help you identify the Connecticut warbler. They're a special treat around here. So once again, they're a nice one. Get a photo if you can, and then put it in eBird because we need as much evidence of them around here as we can. They used to be a not terribly uncommon breeder in the Upper Peninsula. Now it's been years since anyone's had confirmed breeding around here. So if you find a Connecticut warbler in June, please, please, please put it in eBird. Here's a very similar looking bird to the Connecticut, but the biggest thing, it's actually pretty distinct too, isn't it? It doesn't have those eye rings. This is a morning warbler. It's got a very similar hood, overall similar structure to the Connecticut warbler, but missing the eye ring. Here's a common yellow throat. This is what the male looks like when he's starting to, or when he's molting, they're normally a little bit bolder than that even in terms of their face pattern, but look at the yellow throat and look at the little bit bigger, flatter bill compared to some warblers. Here's the female common yellow throat. It's another one of those that sometimes I wonder, what am I looking out at and have to rule out everything else before I finally come to the conclusion, oh yeah, this is a female yellow throat. But the different shape in that yellow throat with a plain face should help lead you toward common yellow throat. American Red Start is one of those fairly unmistakable birds around here. They're black and orange in the male plumage and very similar pattern, just different colors in the female or juvenile plumage, but they're a very ostentatious bird. They like to show off and flash that tail the way this bird is doing. And they're pretty conspicuous. So if you go to Peninsula Point anytime during breeding season, watch out for American Red Starts. There's a couple of them there. And they are a really neat one to watch. The Kirtland's Warbler is a big specialty around these parts, obviously. They don't breed in any significant numbers outside of Michigan. There's a couple here and there in Wisconsin and they're working on increasing those numbers, but Michigan is their big stronghold. And most years they are found several pairs in the Sawyer Plains, sometimes on the Yellow Dog Plains, 
but they're around Marquette County as a breeder. And they're a great one to take a look at and see the differences. They don't really have any great confusion species. They'll share a similar habitat with things like Nashville warblers, but look at the eyes. We've got these broken eye arcs, these streaked sides, lots of different things that point you to Kirtland's warbler. Here's the Cape May warbler in male plumage, this nice orange auricular or cheek region. Cetophaga tigrina is their Latin name. That makes me think of the tiger stripes they've got and the coloration they've got. And take a look at this white patch in the wing. And again, this beautiful orange and yellow face. Northern Perula, take a look at the color of the mantle on this bird, the back. That's pretty distinctive, that olive -y color. And the contrast between that olive color and the slaty blue of the rest of the bird, that's all you need to see. And you know you have a northern perula. There's also a few other distinctive characteristics, like the eye arcs and the bird's necklace. Here's the magnolia warbler. In fact, they're so beloved by David Sibley that they're the cover art for the second edition of Sibley Birds. And they, again, like I said, I don't like to use the word unmistakable, but it might apply again here. They do not have much in the way of a confusion species once you get to know the unique patterning of the magnolia warbler. Here's another well-named warbler, the bay-breasted warbler. Take a look at that color. That is unique. Nothing else quite looks like that. Take a look at that creamy nape. Just totally distinct, except in the fall, but that'll be a topic for another time. Here is a beautiful Blackburnian warbler, one of my personal favorites, that incredible contrast between the yellows and oranges and the bold black face mask makes these guys really stand out. Yellow warbler are a pretty common one around these parts. I like to go even to the bog walk here in Marquette. You can find breeding yellow warblers in the summer and they're just one, again, I think all of these warblers are the most beautiful bird, but this really, the subtle streaking, that purplish color is just like no other. And these guys are often going to be found in a kind of a swampy, marshy habitat, um, but yellow warbler. There's not a lot else going on other than the yellow and that purple streaking in the males here. Here's a chestnut-sided warbler, another one very well named, but take a look. There's a couple other features you should key in on as well. Take a look at that yellow cap. Take a look at that face mask. That doesn't look like anything we've seen on any of our other birds. And take a look at that white throat leading into a white breast and belly with chestnut colored sides. Legend is John James Audubon himself only ever saw one of these birds. And I sure am glad I've seen more than that. They're truly one of the most interestingly patterned of the warblers in my mind. Here's a black pole warbler, one I don't see a ton of in the spring, but take a look. It almost looks like a black capped chickadee superficially, doesn't it? It's got that black cap or black pole. Like a red pole has a red spot on the forehead, the black pole warbler has a black forehead. Take a look at those bright legs and remember that for the fall. These are a pretty difficult bird in the fall, but they're really distinctive in the spring. Black-throated blue warbler is a little bit of a Northwoods specialty. And I had an incredible day with these at Whitefish Point uh, just last year. I saw a day with dozens of these flying around. It was unbelievable. They're truly 
one of the most striking colors I've seen on a warbler. Black-throated blue, you can see how they got their name. This is the male, and here's the female. Rather plain, but take a look. The male has this patch at the base of the primaries. The female has it too. That's gonna be one of the key things that tells you this is a black-throated blue female. Just a couple left here. Here's a palm warbler. They're pretty unique with their rusty cap, yellow throat, and streaky breast and sides. Here's a pine warbler, admittedly among the plainer of the warblers. They can be a tricky one because there's not a whole lot of markings to go on. The name actually does help us out here. Pine warblers are pretty fond of nesting in pines. So if you've got a warbler making a trill up high in a pine tree, you've got a pine warbler. Even if you can't see it, they're pretty unique, <clears throat> but they don't have a whole lot of field marks to go on. So that is almost a field mark in and of itself. Yellow rumped warbler, very common in migration, especially. We sometimes, in fact, they were about 50 of them at Peninsula Point a couple days ago when I went. They can be incredibly common at times. But take a look. He's got this yellow crown. In fact, his Latin name is Setophaga coronata. Coronata meaning crown. So he's got this yellow little crown. He's got these yellow spots on the side. And if we could see it a little bit better, the rump, of course, is also yellow, another well-named bird. Here's a black-throated green warbler. Nice big black bib, contrasts well with the yellow face. Canada warbler is gonna be a tricky one to ever see well but they're worth getting a good look at. They're pretty distinctive as well with this necklace going on in the breast and the bold eye ring. Then finally, our last warbler and one of the later arrivals in spring season is the Wilson's warbler. They remind me kind of of a goldfinch sometimes. They've got this yellow plumage with this dark cap. Other than that, they're relatively plain, but the Wilson's Warbler uh, is a real nice little treat that sometimes we'll find skulking around in low vegetation around here. So thanks everybody. I'm really <laughs> glad to have had such a big audience tonight and I would love to take any questions anybody's got. Please feel free to just unmute yourself and uh, jump in with a question. Well done, Gary, that was great. Thank you. Hi, Gary, great job. We both decided, Love yeah, we both decided you should be uh, narrating audiobooks. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and good to see you, by the way. Yeah. Uh, everything you had to say was interesting. I really enjoyed it very much. Oh, thank you. Gary, I don't know if we have more questions. Um, hopefully, um, you know, we'll stay on here a little bit longer, uh, but thank you very much. Uh, those, those were fantastic photos and uh, a really excellent uh, tutorial on those groups of birds. Uh, I, yeah, and I, I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot this evening and, uh, uh, and I've, um, I'm inspired to, uh, to up my birding skills this spring. Oh, great. Well, I, I realized I was negligent in one regard, 
And I did not give nearly enough credit for those photos to Sky Haas. Nearly all of those came from him. Um, most of the hawks and warblers, most of the sparrows, anything that wasn't explicitly labeled pretty much was from Sky. So thank you so much, Sky, for all the lovely, lovely photos. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Sky. Those are some fantastic photos. <clears throat> um, before we leave, and we may have some more questions here, um, but I just wanted to reiterate for everybody that uh, our next program will be uh, in September. And um, uh, normally we have our monthly meetings in Peter White Library. You know, so we've been doing this, uh, you know, uh, uh, virtually uh, for obvious reasons, depending on where we are next fall. Uh, if uh, Peter White is open for meetings, we will probably move back to the library. Uh, and we've been talking about even if we do that, that we may also uh, present these uh, presentations by Zoom as well. So uh, we, we hope folks will join us. And also I wanna shout out to Brian Murphy uh, for, uh, for handling the, the technical, technical aspects uh, and getting this out on Zoom and, and Facebook this evening. You're welcome very much. Um, just a side note on that, it, it did get broadcast on Facebook, but it went to a different web page than Laughing Whitefish. So as soon as we end, I can move it over to Laughing Whitefish. So if anybody would like to view it later, it will be on the Laughing Whitefish fa Facebook page. Okay, great. great. Thank you, Brian. Yep. I don't see any further questions, Gary. So once again, thank you very much. That was really, really excellent. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, have a good one. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. <laughs>